uh, we're going to we're going to move into Roosevelt's presidency and the years thereafter. There's a lot of really interesting information in there. And to start us off, when Ackenbaum has uh, some information to convey to us about uh, someone, I guess, who was uh, joined Roosevelt in Cuba and was killed there. Is that what you're getting to? You're, you're muted, Win. Unmute yourself. Can't hear you. There. Okay. Uh, there was a blurb in the New York Times mentioning the death of Bucky O'Neill, who had, who was the mayor of the Georgist mayor of Prescott, Arizona. Who had, it sounds like he, uh, he may have either learned some of his George from Roosevelt or taught George to Roosevelt. And right now, I don't don't remember wh which of those two things it is. Uh, does it, that make any sense with from anything you know? Well, no, not not particularly. I mean, there were there were single taxers, and certainly Henry George's supporters were constantly in contact with Roosevelt, trying to get him to see the light on the land question. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you, to start us off, I, I wanted to uh, read a little excerpt from uh, something that appeared in the Single Tax Review in 1912 and it is um has to do with the fact that that single taxers uh were constantly critical of roosevelt uh for his failure to 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 do everything that they were looking for as a progressive as a reformer but but here's what uh this uh, editorial in the single taxer uh, single tax review said uh on the part, I'm sorry, it wasn't 1912, it was the year of Roosevelt's death. Um, he's, they say the death of Ro Theodore Roosevelt marks the passing of a most unique and interesting personality and in many respects, an eminently useful citizen. He was as remarkable by reason of his limitations as by his many great qualities. But when all the former are noted, there remains a residuum of useful achievement that entitles, entitles him to a high place among American public men of his period. At the beginning of his career, he was the close friend of Ernest Howard Crosby. And it was this chapter of his work for the reform of the civil service in association with the man who later became one of the high-minded leaders of the single tax movement that can now be recalled with a special honor to the memory of the ex-president. So it was Ernest Crosby, closest to Henry George, who was also close to Roosevelt. So uh, this editorial ends up saying this, single taxers should hold him in high if qualified esteem. As governor of the great state of New York, he jammed through the legislature, the special taxes, the tax on franchises against the will of many of his most influential friends, this aimed, at all events, to take for the people's use the value they contribute by their presence and activities to their roads and highways. So uh, you're going to get a lot of this mixed review on the part of reformers about Roosevelt. And as we go into his presidency, you can really understand why that, in fact, is the case. So, again, where we left off last, last week... Um, it's six months into the second term of President McKinley, and he's assassinated while attending the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. Um, this is 1900. And to reassure the Republican leaders that he would adhere to the party platform, Roosevelt brought no one new into the cabinet. He retained McKinley's entire cabinet. Now, watching over everything that Roosevelt is doing, is Lewis F. Post, who's the editor of The Public. And to remind you who Lewis F. Post was, he was an attorney. Uh, he was one of Henry George's right arm, right arm supporters with him throughout George's campaigns. And he became editor of The Public, which was based in Chicago. Um, he gave the new president some time to feel his way before offering his assessment of, quote, Mr. Roosevelt's administration. However, 
the president seemed already on a course post believed to be dangerous to democracy. In the 7th December 1901 issue, here's what Roosevelt, I mean, what, what Post wrote about Roosevelt. He says, what President Roosevelt is evidently reaching out for in his demand for federal laws against anarchy is centralized power for the suppression of opinions which he and his class do not approve and the arbitrary punishment of men whom they dislike. So already, you know, there's some concern that Roosevelt uh, calling himself a progressive and in certain respects a reformer may end up attacking, attacking individual liberty. And that worries, that worries people like Lewis F. Post a lot. And an editorial that cover, covered two full pages of the public, Post worried that Roosevelt was moving to curtail economic as well as personal freedoms. And he writes this. These are a couple of slides that I'm going to give you on, on this. Uh, bear with me. Centralization is indeed the dominant note of Mr. Roosevelt's message. Besides urging federal jurisdiction over assaults upon federal officials, it proposes a new cabinet officer whose function it shall be to permanently governmentalize American industries, a step in the direction of socialism, which state socialists in their wildest dreams could not have hoped for so soon. Pretty stiff criticism coming from Lewis F. Post, one of the you know, predominant advocates of a, a privilege-free market-oriented economy. Now, there were other things happening as well. There were more Americans were lining up to question Roosevelt's, quote, American values. He angered white racists by meeting with Booker T. Washington at the White House. Um, he'd known Washington for some time and was very supportive of Washington's work at Tuskegee, actually stating that, quote, the salvation of the Negro lay in the development of the Booker Washington theory. And in 1903, he suggested in a letter that was made public that there should be no racial discrimination in the hiring of public servants. He wrote this. I certainly, I certainly cannot treat mere color as a permanent bar to holding office any more than I could so treat creed or birthplace, always provided that in other respects, the applicant or incumbent is a worthy and well-behaved American citizen. Um, I don't know, you know the, the, the term well-behaved American citizen has a certain connotation here. Um, certainly, uh, some would argue that Roosevelt was not a very well-behaved American citizen. And then this letter uh, comes from, from him. As governor of New York State, uh, he had brought an end to segregation in the state's public schools. As president, he appointed a man named Robert Terrell, an, Amer an African-American, to the Office of Justice of Peace in the District of, Col of Columbia. And in 1905, he sent this letter uh, resulting in the appointment of an African-American attorney named Charles W. Anderson to the position of collector of internal revenues for the Second District of New York. Um, yet, as uh, one author, Dewey Grantham Jr., wrote in the June 1958 issue of the Tennessee Historical Quarterly, despite Roosevelt's defiance of the Southerners in the friendly company of his friends, he invited no more Negroes to dine at the White House. Furthermore, he went to considerable lengths to point out that he had appointed fewer Negroes and more white Democrats to federal positions than any previous Republican president. Is this part of his principles or is it his political practicality um, that is at work? And that's a real question with Roosevelt in terms of his ethics. Uh, does the end justify the means? And how far is he willing to go to get the vision of governance that he believes is the right vision? 
Historian named Michael Patrick Cullinane concludes, however, that this hardly scratches the surface of where Roosevelt stood on the question of racial equality as this applied to life in the United States. Uh, he worried, wrote, this is Roosevelt, Roosevelt worried that the low birth rate among some Americans was leading to, quote, racial race suicide. More specifically, his concern was that those of demonstrated ability among whites were not having many children, which suggests he was observing that those with less ability among whites were having perhaps too many children. On the economic front, he now sought to make use of provisions of the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act to rein in the monopoly power of the trusts. This is a cartoon from the era that's pretty widely known. You can find this on the internet, but you can see all the, 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 the major trusts in the country and they're hovering over the Congress and over legislation. The act had become law while Roosevelt was serving in the U.S. Civil Service Commission. And so this, this was a piece of legislation he thought he could make good use of. The principal author of this act was John Sherman, the United States Senator from Ohio and the former Secretary of the Treasury under Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, Sherman had taken up the issue a couple years earlier uh, and kept working to build support. However, Sherman's biographer, Theodore Burton, described Sherman both principled and as an effective politician. So here's someone, again, who is looking to get reform passed and done, but he's got to deal with the real world politics. Here's what uh, uh, Burton says about, about Sherman. His thought was of principles and policies rather than of men, of the aggregate made up of all the people rather than of individuals. To him, men were entrusted with the administration of affairs were merely the agents of the people in great public movements. So what was going to happen now? I mean, this is, this is an interesting uh, involvement in these policy decisions, particularly because Sherman was from Ohio. And in researching Sherman's biography, I find somewhat surprisingly, there was no mention uh, that Sherman had any views on Henry George's ideas or made any comment about George or Tom L. Johnson. Um, why is that strange? Well, Tom L. Johnson, who was a firm supporter of Henry George's uh, political economy, had been elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1890 and again in 1892 from Ohio. And then he became, he went on to become mayor of Cleveland, Ohio, and <clears throat> did everything he could to eliminate the, the, monopoly franchises in the streetcar uh, industry there in, the, in, in Cleveland and in the state. And so there had to be some kind of relationship between the two, but, but uh, Sherman doesn't acknowledge in, in, in anything I can find that he sympathized with what Johnson was trying to do. Well, getting back to Roosevelt, excuse me, just a second. <clears throat> Any, any comments or questions uh, on what I've gone through so far? Let me stop and, and check in with you. Marty. Yeah, I, I just wanted to let you know, I've got uh, two large volumes of the uh, autobiography of uh, John Sherman. So I'll, I'll take a look after the class to see if there's any mention, but uh, it's, it's a very exciting, uh, biography uh, over his whole life. Um, yeah, it, it probably is. It probably is worthwhile, you know, thinking about doing a talk on, on Sherman, particularly if you can find that he ha had strong views one way or the other in support of of Johnson's work in Ohio. And, and of course, uh, anything that, that he had to say about Henry George's, you know, uh, solutions to economic problems and poverty. But that's great. Any, anyone else uh, have any anything you'd like to add at the moment? Okay, well, 
Ed, I, I, have a, I have a question. Okay. Not a question, a comment, probably, and you could call it a question. So I know uh, TDR was very famous for uh, his stance on uh, trust, right? Monopoly. Yeah. Yes. And I that's one area where he, his view would converge with Henry George. So I'm wondering, what about his position on taxes? Uh, believe, well, we'll get into that. The simple answer is he was very much in favor of the taxation of wealth. Okay. There are some issues about, you know, his position there. He did not, he didn't, he certainly did not think it through the same way that George did or that George's supporters did. And, and I'll get into that as we go through. Okay. So here, here's a cartoon from that period with Roosevelt, you know, attempting to take the, the air out of the trust. Um, and all the money that's leaking out. So as he began his term, he was fully aware of the public concern over the rapidly consolidating character of the nation's industrial and the financial enterprises. At the same time, however, he had no desire to use more government than was absolutely necessary to sort of rein in this power. Um, a Texas A&M University professor named Leo Dorsey wrote, in a 1950, 1995 article as follows about his positions. He says, with social order as his overriding concern, President Roosevelt used the bully pulpit to urge restraint by both big business and its muckraking critics and to lessen the attendant apprehension of the American people. Power of persuasion appealing to their their morality, their ethics. Well, would that be sufficient to, you know, tame the beast? Well, we know that certainly that that isn't the case. Um, that a, a certain amount of government inter intervention and regulation is necessary, and laws have to be good. Laws have to be passed, and then you know they have to be enforced. So uh, this is part of. Part of what Roosevelt's character is, he, he thinks that people can be persuaded to behave. And, you know, and if they can't, yes, we'll, we'll uh, bring down, we'll, we'll, we'll do something to intervene. But we, but we hope that that's not necessary to the extent possible. Professor Dorsey points out that at least one biographer, Henry Pringle, argues that Theodore's image as a trust buster was an exaggeration. Pringle points out that the president initiated only 25 suits under the Sherman Antitrust Act, while his successor, William Howard Taft, started 45. So that's what Pringle concludes. Dorsey, however, looks at the same history and he expresses disagreement. His view is as follows. He says, Roosevelt actually accomplished a great deal. He did not break up many trusts, but he did provide a sympathetic ear and a powerful voice for the unfocused discontent of the country regarding the growth and abusive practices of corporations and trusts. With his public rhetoric, the president led a symbolic crusade against impersonal and amoral forces. So, you know, perhaps he's right that Roosevelt, you know, gave encouragement to, to those reformers who, who uh, would call for more, um, while he himself kind of refrained from getting too far along that line. Roosevelt did join with others who attempted, who, who were trying to deal with the railroads. So he believed that the railroad combinations were the most immoral and the most corrupt. Thus the Northern Securities Company which was the nation's largest railroad monopoly controlled by J.P. Morgan uh, and others. They, this stood out as a serious threat to the nation's market system, Roosevelt felt. Um, and then there's John D. Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Trust that benefited enormous, enormously by lower rail charges that they got from the Northern Securities Company than other producers could get. And so that those two monopolies and their power justified antitrust action. So more broadly, Theodore promised what he called a square deal. 
Oh. And we eventually got the new deal, didn't we, with, with the second Roosevelt as president. At the time that Theodore became the president, Standard Oil of New Jersey served as the holding company of stocks in 41 other companies. The details were made public by Ida Tarbell, who was the managing editor of McClure's magazine beginning in November of 1902. And articles appeared for 24 months that were then published in book form. And Tarbell's work, her you know, disclosures uh, brought you know, the public attention to Standard, Standard Oil of New Jersey. And the end result was a determined effort by the Roosevelt administration uh, to bring about the dissolution of Standard Oil. Uh, it required until the end of 1906 for Roosevelt's people to assemble all the evidence that was required. And then it took three more years of testimony and finally, Standard Oil was ordered to be dissolved, um, broken down into what were called the was six or seven sisters, uh, all, all of which were big enterprises in their own right. Well, the decision was held up by the U.S. Supreme Court, um, but the lower court had tried to fine uh, Rockefeller $25 million, and the upper court overturned that fine. Uh, I couldn't find the evidence exactly of, of what amount, if any, fine was actually paid by Rockefeller or Standard Oil. Well, <clears throat> there was a lot more that was happening during those first years that Roosevelt was in office. One major domestic problem uh, erupted in, the May, in May of 1902 when anthracite coal miners went on strike and remained out for 10 months. Um, someone I'm sure can figure out why, why this was such a terrible uh, problem for the country. Anyone have a good, easy answer? I'm assuming it was the railroads that, that, that were- Everybody off. was burnt, was, Houses were all heated. Buildings were all heated with coal. So, I mean, uh, you, you think about it. You you might remember your 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 grandparents who 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 had coal delivered and dumped into their basement every year you know, in the winter time to heat the house. So, you know, absent coal, there was going to be no heat in the winter for people uh, in their homes. Uh, it was this was not yet an era where oil burners were widespread in, in residential properties and even in commercial properties. So uh, with the strikers out for 10 months, this really was a national disaster. Um, Roosevelt finally intervened to broker a deal. This gave workers an eight hour workday and an increase in their pay. And he called this another victory for the square deal. In 1903, his administration then took on the issue of land fraud and speculation that was occurring by the General Land Office. The commissioner uh, was forced to resign and cases of bribery were, were brought against other officials in Oregon, including this fellow, John H. Mitchell, who was a U.S. Senator. Uh, Mitchell was convicted along with others but he died in 1905 while his conviction was being repealed or appealed, not repealed. So uh, there's a lot going on in, in terms of, of government corruption at Roosevelt, you know, was totally upset and committed to, to remove as best he could. Um, all along, Louis Post is following everything that Roosevelt is doing in the administration. So, at the public, he is uh, getting all of you know Roosevelt's public statements, comparing them with the actions that it, he and his administration take, and then commenting on them in the in the pages of the public. If if you look at the, what I've compiled uh, on my website uh, under under the public, uh, 
every issue has one or two articles that are dealing dealing with the Roosevelt administration's actions and act, and activities. And there are other other uh, editorial comments by by different people other than Louis Louis Post. So this is an ongoing uh, evaluation of what the Roosevelt administration is actually accomplishing and to the extent that it's consistent with or inconsistent with the principles that post feels are are essential to uh, creating a justice society and, a, and an efficient economy, you, you get a lot of that comment. So after Roosevelt delivers his State of the Union message early in 1904, Post comes out and cautions his readers to think critically about what he says is the superficiality of Roosevelt's thinking. And, and here's, what, uh, here's what Post wrote. There's a couple, couple quotes that I'm going to read to you. What interests us most in, Ro in Mr. Roosevelt's speech is his economic suggestions. With his ob objection to establishing a line of cleavage dividing those who are well off from those who are less well off, we are in hearty sympathy. The true line of cleavage for society to draw is not between rich and poor, nor good and bad, nor is it between persons at all is between natural freedom of economic opportunity on the one hand and legalized privilege on the other. And this is this is the fight that occurs. And one of the parts of this fight, of course, is how are you defining legalized privilege? What is privilege? And in post mind, consistent with Henry George, the very ownership of land without appropriate compensation to society is a legalized privilege. It is a way to redistribute wealth from producers to a non-producing rentier elite. Post goes on. He writes, at one point, Mr. Roosevelt seems to recognize dimly the essential propriety of this line of cleavage, for he remarks that, quote, Materially, we must strive to secure a broader economic opportunity for all men. But whatever encouragement might be drawn from this remark is dampened by Mr. Roosevelt's advocacy of a progressive tax intended to prevent the transfer of large fortunes beyond a certain amount to any one individual. And, and Post adds this to that. Curiously enough, Mr. Roosevelt proposes this confiscatory measure for, quote, all fortunes, utterly regardless of how they are won, in almost the same breath in which he insists upon discriminating be fortunes, between fortunes well won and fortunes ill won. And this is an extremely important, you know, issue for reformers at the time. Uh, if we're going to have a progressive form of income tax, should that progressive progressiveness apply to all income or should it apply to some income uh, based on how it is derived? I mean, there's, there's, these are really important issues for those single taxers and for reformers who side with Henry George and come, come, to the, um, come to their perspective based on this issue of whether or not one is deriving income based on privilege, landed privilege, other kinds of privileges, uh, subsidies, licenses, et cetera, or you're earning your income by producing goods and providing services that people want. Uh, let me stop and ask, you know, uh, most, of, most of the people on, on here tonight certainly are familiar with Henry George's analysis, but maybe there are a few of you who aren't, and you're hearing this maybe even for the first time. So any any questions, any reactions to what I've just told you about this distinction? Does it make sense to you? Uh, does it seem like socialism, which some, uh, some argued it was? Could you bring back the slide, Ed? Which slide? The one that's, the yeah. No thoughts. I think uh, I think there is a clear difference between uh, 
Henry, George, what would be George's position on the wealth tax and uh, what we are hearing here? Because uh, the wealth tax, broadly defined, doesn't really look into how the wealth was made. So it just confuses uh, wealth that is made uh, through labor and capital that is rightly earned and also wealth that is probably what we call uh, in, in, in George's lingo, uh, unearned income. So I think uh, uh, Post's insistence, and I would assume that would be George's position, is a real wealth, a wealth tax should focus on, uh, for example, what we would call unearned income. And nothing in that tax should entail taking what people have rightly earned, which is labor or capital. Marty has a comment to make, but but before I pass on to Marty, I just want you to think about this question, and that is, we've had an unfair system for so long that has allowed for the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a smaller and smaller minority. The question is, what sort of transitional pr process or policies are warranted in order to mitigate that transition while we move towards the system uh, that you've just described that Henry George embraced. I just let you think about that for a minute and I'm gonna comment on that after I hear from Marty. Yeah, that, that's a good uh, point to bring up. Uh, I guess the thing I wanted to uh, uh, suggest is that uh, the opponents of Henry George could very easily support that that more extreme uh, uh, you know wealth tax uh, because it's um, it, it's like it's uh, it's like uh, it's like an extreme that doesn't consider something more reasonable of uh, Henry George it's kind of like uh, maybe behind the scenes uh, a conservative, uh, supporting a Marxist, for example, uh, to drive up the, uh, the it's kind of like a protection racket kind of thing, uh, so that you would drown out a, a more reasonable uh, point of view. So um, I think, well, as, often, a as is often said, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Yeah. And, and, and so while, while we, we, we work for the kinds of reforms that are necessary to get us to a point where we could have a full employment society, a society you know, without poverty. We have this massive amount of wealth that's been accumulated you know, at the very top. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what sort, of, what sort of tax policies might mitigate the situation without harming the, the and move toward a full employment economy. I have my own thoughts on this. Um, and at some point, I, I'd love to organize a debate about it. Yeah. But very quickly, it's my view that we could start with the individual income tax. Okay. And we could do two things to make it, number one, much more, much easier to comply with and much more progressive, progressive in the sense that it could capture the unearned income from rents and from uh, privileges. The easiest way to do that, in my view, would be to start off by eliminating uh, all income taxes on incomes up to some amount. Mm -hmm. So let's say the national median income would be that, that number. That's about $60,000. So on every individual in the country, regardless of how you derived or earned your income, your first $60,000 would be free of federal taxation. There would be no other exemptions or deductions. And then above the exempt amount, there would be an increasing rate of taxation applied to higher and higher ranges of income. So we could hypothetically get back to a high the highest marginal tax rate uh, that it once was at least the nominal high, highest tax rate of about 87 percent on incomes let's say over whatever the number would be a hundred million dollars 
I don't know what that number would be, but, um, but certainly at that level of income, what we know from analysis is that most of it is derived from speculation in markets, whether it's a stock market, the land market, the commodities market, uh, and all sorts of other franchises and subsidies. So that would be my starting point for calling for reform that put, would pull us in the right direction. Um, Marty, did you want to comment back to me on that or you want to move on to something yes. else? No, I just wanted to uh, support that idea and uh, maybe point to Detroit because it seems like Detroit has uh, uh, captured the the idea of how do you win support while well, you you come up with a scheme where most people benefit and when they have a uh, they have a vote uh, to implement this thing you've already campaigned so to speak. Uh, to show everybody who's going to benefit. So I think in your scheme, it would be do away with the income, but uh, income tax, but what is it that we're going to make, or uh, what are we going to tax to make up so that you're always coming to zero and you you push the, uh, the boulder, uh, you know, toward a, a good point. Well, but let me, I mean, I, I don't want to I don't want to get too far into a tangent on this, but it's tempting to do that. Um, I mean, we have we have a budgeting process at the federal government level. And so the rates and ranges of income could be determined in uh, consistent with the budget requirements in order to achieve a balanced budget. I mean, that's, you know. Uh, calculating all the sources of revenue that would come in, how much revenue do we need from the individual income tax, and then determine what the rates and ranges would be based on budgetary needs and apply the same logic, for example, to the amount of tax that businesses would pay. And there again, you know, there are other options. Some states have moved to a gross revenue tax to replace the business profits tax. And economists that I've looked at generally have a positive view that a, that a tax on gross revenue, a graduated tax on gross revenue, is is um, a from an economic standpoint a better form of raising revenue from businesses than a business profits tax for a whole lot of reasons. Um, Ibrahima, do you did you still have a comment? Uh, yes, I was just wondering, I think your proposal sounds interesting, but I'm wondering how does it uh, align with George's uh, canons of taxation? Let's plan to have a debate on on, on this okay. issue down, right. down the road a little bit. Okay. Sure. Um, W.E. Perry. Yeah. Hi, Ed. Hello. What, what you're proposing is by historical definition, precisely the establishment of religion. From the time that Constantine made the Christian religion the authorized belief of the empire in 325, uh, the point of being the established religion is that you get to collect the tithe. That is that a set of beliefs harnesses the taxing power of the state, and indeed the coercive power of the state generally, in order to support a particular set of beliefs financially. This is best explained in Thomas Jefferson's uh, notes and diary entries at the time he was composing the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberties, which abolished the establishment of the Church of England in Virginia. And his early readers came back to him and said, but who will pay for the orphanages and who will pay for the soup kitchens and who will pay for the charitable works? And his point was that people would have to be as good as they said they were because the most offensive of all the measures to democracy and to freedom of belief was that the government should have the power to tax and to coerce on behalf of a specific set of beliefs. 
this was actually still understood as late as 1912, 1913. The 16th Amendment gives the Congress the right to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived, but it's silent on the question of purpose. And if the purpose of those taxes is to impose a particular set of beliefs, however general or good you think those beliefs are. You know, we should feed the poor, uh, we should uh, remove inequalities in societies. Those are nevertheless beliefs. And that favoring, that establishment of those particular beliefs is forbidden by the First Amendment. The reason we're Georgists is because he completely understood this. He understood that private property cannot legitimately be taxed for the purposes of a Congress dominated by the majority. That is a fundamental violation of the First Amendment and the Establishment of Religion Clause. That's the reason that the Georgist principles are based on public ownership of land rather than private ownership of land. Because I, I, would, I would suggest the, the use of the word public is maybe better if you say societal. Well, how are they different? Well, because, because uh, if, if, you, if you think that if you agree with Locke that we come together to form societies by voluntary association, and then we choose the form of government under which we want to live, then you know society is different from public. Public has a, a connotation of, of institutional, in my view. Only to statists. No, public means those things to which the community consents. Well, um, I guess if I have, I, I'm, uh, if I have to just justify my idea again, it's we're so far away from where we we ought to be if we were, uh, you know, living uh, in the, under the scheme that Henry George advocated to us as a just a just scheme of of governance. That the question is, how do we get back? How do we get from here to there? Very and, simple. And, enforce, and what, enforce the First Amendment. Make that it, will never uh, happen. I mean, well, I, it, I, will, I, it will. It will. It will happen. It will happen next year, uh, when the debt becomes unpayable. Uh, the, well, the fourth quarter of twenty twenty four, um, it falls apart, and at that point, uh, the way government is constituted and indeed the way government funds itself, all become open questions, uh, the same way they did in Paris in 1790. And the way they were they were being coming into question in 1900 as well, I mean. Absolutely. So, um, we, what you bring up is a subject for a, a whole other intense conversation, and, and it's we perhaps should think about having it, you know, scheduling that at some point in the future. Uh, uh, think about, we all need to think about what measures we can support. I mean, uh, this discussion about the U.S. Constitution is a discussion that has many sides of disagreement on what those words mean. And well, those disagreements are manufactured. The plain meaning of the word is not only clear from their inherent semantics, uh, but also from the history on which they're predicated. Everything else is just, you know, casuist manipulation. Well, I'm going to leave, leave that, that part of our discussion for the, for the time being and move on. Uh, Joe Polito has a, has a comment or a question. I do. Uh, first of all, let me say thanks so much for all that very interesting detail that you've highlighted about uh, Roosevelt and, and 
posts and so forth. That's just fascinating. I hadn't heard any of it. Um, second, I would say that the uh, your income tax idea I, I like. Uh, I would say part of that might be to eliminate the preferential treatment of capital gains, which helps to increase inequality. And finally, I really like uh, the fact that you focus on you, you go beyond the, the the trees and look at the forest and talk about uh, what these changes, uh, the single tax, for example, could mean to society. Um, you know, there's a purpose. And, and to that end, I'm just going to put in the chat um, a um, link to a positive Pengar uh, seminar tomorrow. They a few days ago, they had over 350 people attending, and who knows what it is now. Um, but it's about climate, monetary reform, tax reform, and so forth. Uh, they're going to have a bunch of politicians there. Uh, after the lecture, they'll be participating in a panel. It sounds like the kind of thing that uh, the different organizations of goodwill, uh, foremost among them is the Georgist, uh, need to ally uh, ally to get to um, making those progressive situations. So I, I put that link in and perhaps some of you are interested and want to sign up. Okay, Thanks Joe. Again, Ed. Yeah, let me, I, I just want to note that Joe, Joe is a citizen of Canada and I don't know what your constitution says. If your constitution has provisions similar to ours with respect to freedom of speech separation of church and state and all of that. Um, we can't really get into it now, but it would be certainly, it would be interesting to me to have you participate in that discussion. So we, you know, the, the written constitutions that we have in different countries uh, have such a different effect on the law and how it's interpreted. And then the power of the courts to interpret law as either consistent with or inconsistent with that yet written constitution. And then we have the British experience, you know, which is altogether different uh, as well. So I think those are those are issues that would be uh, be great to have a conversation about. Um, yeah, but, I'd love I'd love to do that. Uh, the only thing I will say is that ours is very similar. Obviously, uh, yours was the first, and it was a great model for everybody. The one thing that we did add in 1980 was that uh, our rights are not absolute. Because obviously, in that kind of thinking evolved in uh, the American case law. So, for example, you can't cry fire in a in a theater, right? And so, rights aren't absolute. It was part, you know, kind of an evolvement in ours. I don't know if that's formally written in yours, but it's formally written in ours. But it's it very much imitates the American model. Well, uh, we 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 went off on a bit of a tangent. Uh, but I think it, there's some important issues being raised that were, were certainly, you know, uh, on the docket. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt and his presidency, he's dealing with the Supreme Court. He's dealing with uh, the potential for any laws that he and the Republicans pass uh, to be reviewed by the Supreme Court to see if they were constitutional or not and maybe overturned. Um and he has another mindset, which I'll which I'll end with tonight, and we can have a few minutes more of discussion. And that is the U.S.'s, the United States' role with the rest of the world. Uh, and his in his mind, the Monroe Doctrine is still in effect. As far as he's concerned, European powers are to be kept out of the Western Hemisphere entirely, and so consistent with this position. He decides to intervene to enable Panama to break free of Colombia and set the stage for the U.S. control over the Canal Zone. And here's a photograph of him there in 1906. And so I'll end with this quote, which is really interesting in its, in its uh, connotation with regard to the decision to do what he did. He says, you want me, you want me to do that one? Go ahead. We can finally give you a chance to speak tonight on behalf of Teddy. <laughs> OK, I took the isthmus, started the canal and then left Congress not to debate the canal, but to debate me. <laughs> <laughs>
um, you know, by what right did the United States, you know, have to do this? Um, how could how could the United States and a country formed by breaking away from European domination now use its newfound uh, industrial might and power to attempt to intervene in countries outside of its geographical territory, out of its sovereignty? And these are some of the questions that we'll deal with next week as Roosevelt uh, embarks on a much more aggressive foreign policy than the United States had embarked upon up to that point. Marty? Well, I, I think it's just a continuation of the of the war uh, against Spain. You know, he was kind of like on a roll. So uh, he found an opportunity to uh, justify that. And it, uh, I don't think he was going to get a lot of opposition. So I think he just, it's kind of like uh, us bombing uh, Iraq. I mean, we uh, we didn't have any reason to, we just did it. Well, there is a strong anti-imperialist society in the United States that's holding conferences and attempting to um, build public support to you know keep the United States out of all of these these adventures. Um, so it's not as though it's I don't you know it's hard to say whether or not a majority of the American population uh, was in support of the measures that Roosevelt and the Congress were taking. Uh, remember, there are millions of immigrants who have come into the country from the 1870s on and are continuing to come in. Uh, certainly, this population has has a different view of what, you know, why they came to the United States, what they expect, you know, to find when they get here and what kind of government they feel comfortable in supporting. So it's a, it's a, it's an interesting period of time for America, for Americans. Put that in quotes, you know, uh, how many Americans are really assimilated into support of this so-called American system, which includes this whole idea of manifest destiny and support of the Monroe Doctrine. Other thoughts? Uh, the last five or six minutes uh, are yours. <clears throat> well, if everyone is... Mr. Perry, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not trying to dominate the conversation this evening. Um, but Washington's words in his farewell address were avoid European entanglements. Yeah. That's the key. And since 1917, uh, we have utterly violated the fundamental Washingtonian principle. And it doesn't begin with Washington. I mean, if you look at Europe in the 17th century, the wars of religion have turned into a contest over who will be the authorized religion, who will be the established religion. You know, the first phase of the wars of religion uh, ends with the Peace of Westphalia, decreeing uh, cuius regio eius religio, that is, uh, he who reigns uh, is his religion. Um, but that only allows for two choices, Catholicism and Lutheranism, and the Calvinists have been left out. So you have a second wave of wars of religion, which ends with the Peace of Westphalia on exactly the same principles. But the point is that there is no such thing as an unauthorized religion in the European understanding. I mean, the Peace of Westphalia is generally considered to be the beginning of the nation states. And those nation states are united by various forms of nationalism, including an established national religion. But the people, the Europeans who did not fall for that, left and came to North America, where it was not a contest between whether your religion or his religion will be 
officially established for our nation state. It was, there was no established religion. And for the first 150 years, essentially no established government in terms of nation state governance. Well, if my so memory the, serves me correct, the Virginians still were collecting tithes uh, from their citizens for a while uh, until it was eventually uh, outlawed. Oh, sure. That that went on until, as I was saying earlier, uh, Jefferson disestablished yeah. the Church of England and the Virginia Statute of Religious Liberties. Uh, meanwhile, the Puritans and other Congregationalists in New England were collecting within their own congregations, but that's just the point, that where you have a consenting polity which agrees to tax itself for the advancement of shared belief, that's a very different thing than the coercive set of nationalist beliefs, including the established national religion, which as late as Washington's time was exactly what characterized Europe as distinct from the new world in the eyes of the founding generations of Americans. Once we re-involved ourselves in Europe, and we've now come to the final, <laughs> who would have thought that, you know, we're now invested in uh, the border dispute between Russia and its sometimes vassal Ukraine, um, from what standing? Well, the effect of that has not only been that we have lost the founding principle that we are not involved in the disputes of nation states based on national identities and national established beliefs, uh, but we are the champions in our own hemisphere of those who reject the European model. That's the basis of the Monroe Doctrine. Yeah, but here, here's where we get into problems. And this begins, I mean, this is consistent with the era that we're talking about. And that is, um, how do you, you know, how do you bring, how do you justify if you're in 1900 and you're, um, you know, someone who believes that America is a pluralistic society in which there's no established religion and there's no established hierarchy, that um, that we we have a justification to spread out beyond the territorial borders that that have been um, expanded to, and this is where the argument was made last week. You know, when it brought up the whole issue of the frontier disappearing, and various historians saying, well. Uh, you know, the Americans migrated, you know, filled up the territory as as uh, the Spanish left it or gave it to Napoleon Bonaparte. He sold it to Jefferson. And then the Russians sold sold their claims in Alaska to the United States. And we filled up that part of the continent. Well, we also went to war against Mexico. And there was a whole lot of debate about whether or not to to uh, annex Mexico. And there were there were debates and concerns about the fact that, well, these the people in Mexico, they aren't Americans in their attitude. They have a whole they have a whole different history of governance and experience inconsistent with our principles. And so that would be a mistake. It would weaken our, quote, democracy. And then you know we we move we go all the way to the Philippines. How do how can we how can we justify that? You know that's it, it, these are these are well. This is I mean the specific question there. But they're is, not they're not related you know, to faith. That's just that's just they're related to morality. That's just PR sucking up to the Council of Europe. I mean he did it first with the Treaty of Peace with Spain, uh, but then he did it most egregiously with the Treaty of Portsmouth. I mean, you know, the Council of Europe, which was established by the Congress of Vienna in 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, had to approve uh, treaties. And they had no mechanism for approving the surrender of Russia, which was a member of the council and a Christian nation, 
to Japan, which was not a member of the council and not a Christian nation, uh, but they were delighted to accept Roosevelt's suggestion uh, that he would broker yeah. the peace. And they were delighted because they'd already seen how well he dealt with the politics of the Council of Europe in the surrender of Spain. And of course, you get the Treaty of Portsmouth, Roosevelt wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, it sets the stage for the Pacific theater of the Second World War, certainly. Um, it's um, it, it sets it's very much of American ex question. expansionism, and and this whole new era of of the United States eventually accepting the responsibility to make the world safe for democracy, even though we don't have effective participatory democracy here in this country, but certainly not for the majority or or anywhere close to all of our citizens. And well, I, yeah, but democracy we, in that in that phrase has come to mean party democracy, which is nothing other than competing nationhood, uh nation state beliefs. I mean if you posit Wilson versus Roosevelt, uh, at the end, they actually share 80% of the beliefs that the sort of party democracy, which became nationhood, which became nationalism under, under Lincoln, uh, is somehow compatible with European notions of democratic statehood. It's not. I hesitate to continue much more of this conversation because we could be here for another hour or two. But I, I do have one final sort of observation that I would ask everyone to think about in terms of what we've been talking about here. And that is with regard to religion, um, the founders of the United States, of the American system, they did believe in freedom of religion but they the some of the some of Jefferson and 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 a few others may have believed in freedom from religion but they were certainly uh not very vocal about that the closest they came to it was their support of deism but in their public speaking they could never admit that, that they were in favor of allowing people to practice atheism. I mean, after all, you know, that's what Roosevelt said about Thomas Paine, that Thomas Paine was nothing but a dirty little atheist. And this, to me, is still part of what haunts us from our origins and, and up through, you know, to very recent times. When, you know, when, when the real question came when John F. Kennedy was going to, you know, uh, campaign to be the president of the United States. Would Americans elect a Catholic? We did, but there was certainly no certainty. When Barack Obama announced his candidacy, would Americans elect someone who's black? Who knew? He did get elected. Uh, would someone run for presidency? as a homosexual, as, as a gay person? Would they possibly get elected? Interesting question today. Um, when 46% of young Americans under the age of 30, I believe is the study, uh, say they have no religious beliefs whatsoever or no religious affiliation whatsoever. Um, we're, we're a society that's evolving subject to all of these you know, events going on around us and where we're going to end up. Uh, the question that I guess this this series of lectures on on Theodore Roosevelt in our discussions is how much does this tell us about where we might end up? Does it give us insights into the mistakes that we've made and what we should perhaps pursue to remedy the problems that we have?
Wayne, I'll give you the last comment before we break up tonight. Oh, one thing is not generally known is that Frank, Teddy Roosevelt uh, actually for actually tried to take in God we trust off American coins, and they, there were some limited edition pieces that did not have it. He, uh, but he it was you know you had to kind of had to backtrack. Interesting. Yeah, and it, his his reason was it wasn't that he was an atheist. He wasn't. Uh, but he figured that the uh, the coins would inevitably be used for immoral purposes, and he thought that was kind of inappropriate <laughs> to have 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 the deity on the coins that would be used for quote immoral purposes unquote. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, that phrase was taken off of the uh, nineteen thirty two dollar bills. I, I've got several that don't have uh, "In God We Trust." That they were not, they didn't appear on, didn't appear on paper currency until the 1950s. And it didn't appear on all coins until the, uh, until the Buffalo nickel went out of circulation. Just a, a small, but important uh, indication of how important this debate has been about the role of, you know, of religion in our society. And, you know, and what are the what are the rights of individuals to not participate? And I think in in a sense that's what uh, you're getting at, uh, Mr. Perry, in terms of you know uh, can an individual secede from society when that individual feels that that the laws of that society are inconsistent with his or her belief system? Uh, how do you secede and live in a you know, geographical territory that has a system of law and governance. But the um, individual precedes the society. <laughs> and to the extent that the society does not reflect the consent, not the consensus, but the consent of its constituent individuals, it is at best a dictatorship. It's certainly illegitimate. Yeah, yeah it, when, when there was a frontier... It gave the opportunity for people who uh, believed they, their their rights, their belief system was was being uh, uh, stepped on to find another place to go to. Um, I, there aren't very many places now where people can go to. Uh, well, because you, don't, you don't need a geographic frontier. Uh, you can see it in one of the most densely populated places in this country. Uh, which is Midwood and Borough Park in Brooklyn, home to more sects of the Hadadim, the ultra-Orthodox, than anyone can count. Um, and I've lived among them for a number of years, and I've watched how when a congregation reaches the natural limit of a, of a congregation, which is somewhere between 150 and 200 families, uh, there's a schism. And the heretics go off and found a congregation with marginally different beliefs. Um, and they do that house to house in a part of Brooklyn, which is as densely populated as anywhere in this country. But and their behavior is still subject to laws of the city of New York and to the laws of the state of New York and to the laws of the United States of America. And they have so to a very large extent managed to absent themselves from that <laughs> no i mean if you just look at it in practical effect yeah. uh, now this came to a head during the pandemic when their religious gatherings particularly the funerals and the weddings were banned yeah uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis uh they are essentially unaffected and of course part of that is they have their own judicial system i mean the 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 bait dean the 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 House of Justice, the rabbinical court, uh, is the. I think I think you need to talk to Ibrahima about putting together a a session to discuss these issues in terms of the U.S. Constitution and the living document it is, and how people actually live. Um, we've we've gone well beyond our one hour together tonight. With very interesting conversation, but I think in the interest of people who uh, want to get on to the rest of their evening, we should call it a night. 
Yeah, good job. Thanks. I'll be I'll be glad to schedule that uh, conversation Ed once we are done with this one. Thank you, everyone, and uh, we hope to see you again on. Uh, see you on Wednesday, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Good night, all. Bye bye. Good night.